Happy Friday and thanks for joining us on To The Point with Alex Bell, where we dive deeper into issues impacting Northern Californians. I'm Becca Habiger. Alex Bell has the night off. Now, just days ago, Governor Newsom signed a bill into law that aims to change California's broken conservatorship system. It's an issue investigative reporter Andy Judson has been digging into for years now. Tonight, she shows us what this new law will do and is it the change advocates have been calling for? From the streets of Los Angeles to the California State Capitol. It's been a wild ride for Free Britney advocate Leanne Simmons. I started out as an advocate in the Free Britney movement as a lifelong Britney fan. A passion that transformed from Spears to the system. It doesn't take long to see that. This goes so much beyond Britney. It's why Simmons brought disability advocate voices to the stage at Free Britney rallies. We started to kind of shift the focus at a lot of our rallies in Los Angeles to raise awareness about mental health advocacy groups and disability rights advocacy groups. Most under conservatorships are those with disabilities. It's something advocate Judy Mark has been fighting the system on. Why are you conserving these people? When Spears' conservatorship was terminated, there was dancing in the streets. You know, as soon as Britney was free, we kind of took a deep breath. We did it. But the celebration was quick. They had work to do. We didn't have much time to really rest on that because this is such a timely issue that affects so many people. Mark and Simmons used Spears' conservatorship to bring awareness and change to California's broken conservatorship system, a system that impacts thousands across the state. We now want to, to push people to think bigger and to think, what about someone who doesn't have a whole fan base behind them? What about someone who's been fighting these systems and these different entities in our state of California for years and haven't seen any success? Thanks to their efforts, AB 1663 was created and sponsored by Assemblymember Mainshine. At, at heart, this is really a human rights bill. A bill that took a lot of effort and faced opposition. Honestly, it's been such a long road that, um, and there were many times that we weren't sure this bill was going to get passed. Passed just last week. I feel like we have really passed a revolutionary disability rights law in the state of California. The bill has four main goals. Effectively making it harder to put someone under conservatorship and also easier for them to exit that conservatorship. And we do that by saying that if, if, if a person who is conserved just makes one mention, I want out, I am not happy, um, there must be a hearing called to discuss this with them. It gives those already under conservatorship more rights. The conservator is required to make decisions based on the expressed wishes in whatever way they can express it um, of the conservatee. And finally, it will write something called supported decision making into California law for the first time ever. Which gives a person with a disability the opportunity to uh, select ch trusted people who are their supporters to help them make decisions in their lives. AB 1663 will go into effect January 1st, 2023. Mark credits our two-year investigation, the price of care taken by the state for putting pressure to bring change. Your reporting passed a law. Your reporting is getting people out of conservatorship. But our investigation shining a light on this broken system, as well as a bill being passed to change it, is also just the beginning of a long road to reform. Yes, and I think that your reporting is going to really help us get funding to bring transparency to the conservatorship system in California. We still don't have funding that will m require courts to report on how many people they actually have conserved. An investigative reporter, Andy Judson, joins me now. Andy, how impactful that your work has led to much needed changes. Your series, Price of Care, has clearly outlined. If you haven't had a chance to watch that, by the way, it's available on ABC10.com as well as our YouTube channel. Now, Andy, you've been digging into this broken system for years now. Uh, what is your take? Will this bill help and bring this needed change? Yeah, well, any change is good change, right? But it's also worth noting, while this is one of the first kinds of its bills, it's not the first. Last year, AB 1194 was passed, and it also promised to make these big changes to the conservatorship system, but it never actually Actually received the funding it needed in order to make those changes. So it's the same situation with 1663. We just need both of these bills in order to really work to have that financial backing. So that's what's next for lawmakers. Sure. And 
Andy, while we have you here, we also want to ask you about the CARE Court. That is a legislation that Governor Newsom signed into law recently as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, you know, a recent UC Berkeley study found that a large majority of bipartisan voters are in favor of CARE Court. So that's really interesting, right? And experts we spoke with realized that that's really because we have a homeless problem in California, right? So people are ready to see change, and that's really actions being taken to create that change. Yeah, we've also though, heard some really sharply critical criticism of uh, the care court Certainly. system. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, experts have told us there's a number of different issues with it. One is that it's potentially a pipeline to conservatorships if people don't go through the care court system as they should. The other reason is that it's not really a solution. We need more housing, experts are saying. And overall, it's adding more to our already very overwhelmed court system and public defenders as well. So all of these laws go into place January 1st. So we'll see then if they really work or not. We sure will, and I'm sure you will be following it closely with your Certainly, investigative reporting. Yeah. Thanks Absolutely. so much, Andy. Thank you. A lack of teeth. That's what the Merced County Sheriff thinks about the state's judicial system. He is speaking to ABC 10 following the killing of a Merced family of four. A large visual was held for the family last night. Today, we learned the brother of the kidnapping and murder suspect is now in jail. The brother was arrested for helping his brother and destroying evidence. The suspect has a criminal past and was convicted of home invasion in the early 2000s. He broke into his other former employer's house and held them at gunpoint. He was sentenced to 11 years, but was released early on parole in 2015. I fully think that it's because of our lack of teeth in a judicial system that we have in this state that we're, uh, they're allowing the, the criminals to be more brazen and obviously more violent. The brothers could be in court as early as Monday. A new report from the Public Policy Institute of California found that violent crime during the pandemic rose by 6% from 2020 to 2021. They say it was largely driven by gun-related incidents like homicides and aggravated assaults. Something to note, the PPIC says violent crime is still much lower than its peak in 1992. That's important for context. And these rates change dramatically when you look at them by region. Violent crime in Sacramento County rose by nearly 10% in 2021. Violent crime dropped slightly in San Joaquin County, but it still had the highest violent crime rate in the state. Now, we have been hearing a lot about violence over these past few weeks. It can feel overwhelming. We want to know how it's affecting you at home. Has recent crime changed the way you go about your daily life? Well, one person tells us, yeah, no more downtown midtown after dark like I used to. Plus, always keep your head on a swivel and be aware. Another person says, as an ex-gang member from Los Angeles, I'm always on my toes, checking my surroundings, and just very alert. Crime is getting worse. And someone tells us on Facebook, nope, after living in Stockton for 30 years, it is normal still living life. We always want to hear from you. How was all of the recent violent crime impacting your life? Shoot us an email at to the point at abc10.com or you can text us at 916-321-3310. Local emergency responders are still helping in massive search and rescue operations more than a week after Hurricane Ian ripped through Florida. After the break, the impact climate change is playing in all of this. Parts of southwestern Florida still look like a war zone tonight. More than a week ago, Hurricane Ian, a Category 4 storm, made landfall. At least 122 people are dead, and thousands of people have been rescued in what's being called the largest urban search and rescue response in Florida history. First responders from Sacramento area are still there assisting. Crews are still going door to door looking for survivors, and 100,000 people remain without power. Now, Hurricane Ian is part of a growing trend of more intense storms, so we wanted to know, is climate change to blame? Meteorologist Brendan Minchiff offers this insight. It can be tempting to want to tie climate change to Hurricane Ian's intensity, but it can actually be hard to tie climate change to any one particular storm. We can say with certainty the tropical Atlantic is warming over the last hundred years during the hurricane season. We can also say that more hurricanes will become major hurricanes. That is category three or stronger. We can also see a clear 
a uh, clear indication that storms are rapidly intensifying more often. This is at least 30 knots in 24 hours and 50 knots in 24 hours. Look at all the activity uh, in the last 15 years. What we can't say for certainty is that Hurricane Ian was made stronger by climate change, but we can say the impacts from Hurricane Ian, such as the amount of rain that has dropped, such as storm surge flooding when sea levels are already higher on average by seven inches, we can say those impacts were likely made significantly worse because of climate change. Thank you, Brendan. If you are looking to help the victims of Hurricane Ian, we have a list of resources on our website. You can visit abc10.com slash links. Now, odd looking rocks are making this desert town look like an alien world. It's been used in movies and it's home to a lonely mining town. John Bartell is taking us on the back roads. All right, folks, let's talk gas prices. They are so high right now, right? And depending on where you are in the state, they are just at or slightly under the record prices we saw back in June. But I am happy to report experts say relief is in sight. An industry analyst with Gas Buddy told me today he predicts we'll see a drop of as much as a dollar per gallon here in California by late next month. But how did prices get so high again after the summer? And new today, what Governor Newsom says he plans to do about it. Everyone who fills their tanks up are having flashbacks to the summer when we had record high after record high. But this is a different situation. AAA spokesperson John Trainer says right now many of the oil refineries that supply California's gasoline are undergoing maintenance. For some, it's planned routine maintenance. The issue now is while you have a few oil refineries in turnaround, you have more that are in um, other maintenance, unexpected maintenance, unplanned maintenance. And when you have that combination of a bit six refineries going through maintenance and another another going through turnaround um, that really hampers production. So it's it's unique to have this type of situation with a lot of unplanned stuff happening at the same time as planned maintenance. Those refineries and the companies that own them are the subject of much political drama right now. Republican State Senator Brian Daly, who is challenging Newsom for governor in the upcoming elections, says California's taxes and environmental regulations are burdensome on the companies and leading to higher gas prices. Californians should know that we pay a really high tax in California. So there's 54 cents a gallon that goes to fixing our highways. There's another 20 cents a gallon that goes to uh, California Air Resources Board. So it adds up to about $1.20 that Californians pay in taxes for a gallon of gas. At a news conference Friday, ABC 10 political reporter Morgan Reiner asked the question that prompted a fiery response from Governor Newsom. I mean, you can add up all the environmental related costs in California. It doesn't equate to the 250 that they're gouging us on. We're currently, as we speak today, $2.50 more than the national average. There's nothing to justify, nothing, not one thing, to justify $2.50 increase. A week ago, Newsom called for a windfall tax to put record oil profits back in Californians' pockets. Daly pushed back, telling ABC 10, Governor Newsom has the ability to call a special session and we can fix these things. We could drop the gas tax tomorrow and give Californians relief. But Gavin Newsom doesn't want to do that. He just wants to have theater. Then at this same press conference, days after Daly said Newsom wouldn't, Newsom announced a special session set for the same date state legislators start their regular session. We can begin the new session uh, with some vigor and energy and prioritize what people really need and want from us, and that's to address the underlying issues, not just paper over this, is what the oil companies want us to do with gas tax relief. He's calling for state lawmakers to take up the matter on December 5th. It's Friday, which means it's time to hit the back roads. This week, John Bartell takes us to an alien world in the middle of the desert to see the Trown of Pinnacles. At the bottom of the Surlis Valley in San Bernardino County sits the lonely mining town of Trona. A little less than 1,600 people live and work in this sun-beaten community, but you wouldn't know it by the vast emptiness of this place. But if you follow the mineral piles of borax and soda ash out of town, it'll lead you to a whole nother world. This was definitely what people would think of, like what the moon used to look like before um, we actually got there. Standing tall above the Surlis Valley floor are the Trona Pinnacles, a towering series of alien-looking rocks. 
So this is all calcite. Basically everything that we see around here is made of one mineral, and that's calcite. According to geologist Kevin Schreckengost, the lumpy, spiring rock formations are actually not rocks. Here, these pinnacles are made of what we call tufa, which is a type of uh, limestone. Oh wow, it's whoa, crazy bubbles. You may remember tufas from the episode I did on Mono Lake. This is a baby tufa. This is a baby tufa. This is a fresh tufa. Now, without getting too complicated, tufas are simply just a bunch of minerals piled on top of each other. Similar to Mono Lake, the Surlis Valley was what's called a terminal lake, which means snowmelt from the mountains fills up the lake, but there's no outlet or river to release the water. These are essentially just big puddles. Big puddles. <laughs> yep, very big puddles. Over time, minerals from the mountains made their way down into the ancient lake through underground springs and cracks in the earth. Then, eventually over thousands of years, the sun evaporated all the water, leaving minerals behind. Minerals piling on minerals? Is that how it's happening? Yeah, exactly. Kevin says Surlis Lake was several times larger than Mono Lake before all of its water evaporated around 12,000 years ago. And that's why the tufas here are much larger. The tallest of the pinnacles that we have here is about 30 meters, so that's roughly like 90 feet. Because of their size and unique shape, the Toronto Pinnacles have been featured in a number of movies. Planet of the Apes was filmed uh, scenes here, uh, Star Trek V. Amazing. The land. Oh, what could I do? It's also been included in music videos by, I believe, Rihanna and Lady Gaga. Before Hollywood discovered the Toronto Pinnacles, the Surlis family found them in the late 1800s. They were trying to mine for borax and, and other minerals, and they didn't quite understand what they had underneath them for a while. The tufas are made of calcite, which is pretty much worthless, but the ground around the tufas is loaded with borax and another valuable mineral called trona, which is used in glass making, paper production, detergents, and baking soda. It's uh, one of the largest uh, kind of trona operations uh, in the Western United States. The mining operation is far from the trona pinnacles, which are actually protected by the Bureau of Land Management. And that's a good thing because they're fragile and tufas of this size can only be found in a handful of places around the world. From the trona pinnacles, I'm John Bartell. Hope to see you on the back roads. Whew, it is dry out here. Thanks, John. You can find more Backroad stories on abc10.com slash backroads. We can also send a map straight to your phone to help you plan your next road trip adventure. Just text Backroads to 916-321-3310. So speaking of weekend road trips, let's take a look at the Gilmore Backyard. These are your current temperatures. Oh, it looks like a great weekend. Looks like it's a great right now if you still are going to get out for your Friday evening. And let's take a look at your 10 day if you're going to be enjoying uh, one of these last warm fall weekends before the temperatures start cooling off. Oh, it looks like it's going to be really nice heading into next week as well. Enjoy your weekend, folks. Before we go, a lot of events are happening in the Sacramento area this weekend. One of them is celebrating Filipino Americans. Sacramento Filipinex, LGBTQIA, and the Comine Coalition are hosting a two-day event in Elk Grove. The event is split into two days. Tonight's theme is Makaisa, which means to unite. Saturday's theme is called Fire, Filipinex, Inspire, Resist, and Empower. There will be conferences, workshops, and panels connecting Filipino LGBTQ communities. You can catch the event at Laguna Town Hall in Elk Grove tonight until 9 p.m. and then tomorrow from noon to 6. So thanks for spending your Friday evening with us. What's going on in your world? Email the team at to the point at ABC10. Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone, and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com, or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.